Hey, Bridgepoint, it is good to be together today. I want to welcome you. Um, if you are brand new, I want to welcome you to the Bridgepoint family. My name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor here. And um, I remember the first time that not reading the fine print came back to bite me. You know, we hate deals like that where you think you're getting into something good. It looks good at first, and then you realize there are all kinds of strings attached. For me, it was BMG Music Club. Anybody out there? Children of the 90s, all right? I, I had my first job, which meant I got my first bank card, which means I had access to a whole new world. And in the mail, there was this promotion for five CDs for a penny. Anybody remember this? And I'm like, oh boy, here we go. So I opened it up. I'm like, boys to men, check. <laughs> right? REM, yes. You know, I'm just going down. I, you guys remember this. And, and so I got my five free CDs. I'm like, this is going to be sweet. And about a month later, another CD I didn't ask for came in the mail with the price tag of the regular club price of like $19.99. I'm like, hold on a minute. This deal is not what I thought it was. And so I start to look into it. And I realized that by getting these five CDs for a penny, I was committing to overpaying for like six more CDs over the course of the next year or two. And what looked like a good deal turned into a terrible deal because of the fine print, the strings attached. As we walk through the book of Acts, we come to this point where there are some Christians who are having this exact same experience. They thought they signed up for one thing, and other people are telling them it's something entirely different. That There is fine print, strings attached, hidden fees to following Jesus. So what had happened is that there was this group of people who were not Jews, who had heard the message that Jesus is king, that his kingdom had come. And like, I'm in. And they started to live for him, started to delight in life with him. And this set of Christians moved in, to suggest to them that there was something that they weren't yet doing, that they had to do. And this created conflict between the two groups, confusion and frustration. See, following Jesus had become about something much more than just Jesus, and it was diluting the message of the gospel. And the response to that is found in Acts chapter 15, the text that we're studying today. And I believe that this scene in the life of the early church was not just groundbreaking and critical for them. I believe that it is just as important for us today. Because what it does, it brings to to the forefront this question, what is required of someone who wants to choose to enter into the kingdom of Jesus? What is expected of them? What does it mean to be a Christian? And at that time... A lot had been attached to that. It's perfect timing for us because I believe that a lot has been attached to the name Christian today. You take it a step further, born again or Protestant or evangelical. There's an awful lot that is associated with the name of Jesus that was never intended to be. And so today we are going to walk through this story with the question, what is truly required? of those who want to live with Jesus as king. So if you are brand new and you're still trying to figure out who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, my hope is that this has a purifying effect on what you think it means to live with and for Jesus. If you belong to Jesus already, you're in his kingdom living for him, my hope is that this would again purify your understanding of what his kingdom is about and what it means for you to lead others into it. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. I want you to open up there, either using your Bible or your Bible app. This is a critical story for us. And we're going to get to that text in just a minute. Before we do, though, we've got a little background work to do. And before we do that, I want to pray. And so just like, just like we recommend that you do, anytime you open your Bible at home, we want to encourage you to stop, to sit in silence for a moment, to make sure that your heart and mind are ready to receive what God wants to give you. And so we're going to do that together then I will pray and we'll journey together, all right? So take just a moment right where you're at to prepare your heart and your mind. Spirit of God, we believe that you are here. That you are already in and among those who belong to Jesus. And so we approach your word 
which you inspired many years ago. Not with human wisdom or knowledge, but with the surrender to you, asking you to reveal what you know we need to hear today. Spirit of God, I pray that you fill my words with your power and your wisdom for your good purpose, for they would be hollow and powerless without you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So before we get into Acts chapter 15, I want to do a little bit of work to lay the foundation because this church is dealing with an unexpected conflict. There are people who want to come to Jesus, who want to enter his kingdom, who believe in him, and there are Christians that are beginning to argue about what that requires. I mean, imagine this. We've got somebody walk through our doors who's like, hey, I, I heard that I can find Jesus here. I can know him. Like, this is great news, and we want to welcome them and walk them toward Jesus. But imagine that in the midst of that good news, we would start arguing amongst ourselves about what is required of them. We'd never want that. And so we've got to understand how the church got to this point so that we can make sure that this church never gets to that point. Amen? And so here's how it goes, okay? Story starts long ago. God creates mankind to live within the blessings of God to just delight in that, to enjoy that. We're going to use a series of images to represent that. And so the, the first one shows God. God created mankind to live within his blessings. So he created us to experience peace, to experience joy and happiness in life, to experience contentment and purpose and security within our relationship with him, to love him and be loved by him to look around at creation and appreciate all that he has made, to work with satisfaction to contribute to that creation, and then to rest, to delight in it. And, and so God created people to live within what we would call the blessings of God, being close to him without fear, guilt, or shame. But the story of Scripture explains that there are, there are times when every person, including the first people, choose to leave the blessing of God to try to find life apart from him. We have all done it in our own ways over and over again. That's what's called sin. When we leave God to try to find what only he provides. And so that results in mankind standing outside of the blessing of God looking in. Trying to find a way to come back into it. And so in this image we see that the blessing of God still exists. But we have removed ourselves from it. And this creates in every human being, in you and in me and the person next to you and every person you work with or live near, there's this longing for the things that only God provides that are intended to be found in life with him. But when we separate ourselves from him, when we journey apart from him to try and find those things, it leads us on this endless pursuit of pleasure and peace and purpose and security that we will never find without him. And the story of scripture is what God intends to do to bring a wayward people back into the blessings of God. And so he begins with one man, a man named Abraham. We looked at his story during our series called Alpha through the book of Genesis. I want to remind you of the words God spoke to Abraham. This is Genesis chapter 12. This was the beginning of God's efforts to bring humanity back into the blessings of God. The Lord had said to Abram or Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So here's what he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a people group. They would, they would eventually become known as the Israelites or the nation of Israel. And he says, through this nation, I'm going to bring out of your family. I'm going to bless them. But not only them, I'm going to make your family a blessing to all people. In other words, your family is going to be the way that people can return back to live in the blessings of God. And so God established this very special relationship with Abraham's descendants, the people of Israel. It was what he called this covenant agreement that he had with them. So the entrance into that, there was this physical sign that represented them entering into this covenant. It was circumcision. And if you don't know what circumcision is, you can just ask your, the person next to you real quick, and they'll explain it to you. It'll be a really comfortable conversation. And if that doesn't work, just set up a meeting with Pastor Keith this week. He'd be glad to explain it to you, all right? 
But, and now is not the time for me to explain why this was. There is a reason for it, but now is not the time for that. We just need to understand that circumcision was the physical sign of this agreement between God and the people of Israel, okay? And then from there, he went on to define the relationship further. He gave them a set of commandments. Call them the Ten Commandments. Uh, rules to govern their relationship that would lead them into this life that would be blessed by God. God gave them a place, a physical place to interact with him. First it was the tabernacle and then the temple. And at this one place in all the earth, this would be where they interact with the almighty God and they experience his presence. Now, because God is holy and these people are sinful, God also gave them a system of sacrifices to deal with their sin by transferring the cost or the penalty of their sin away from themselves and onto these animals that would be sacrificed in their place. God gave them priests and prophets and kings to maintain this way of life. And here's what God was establishing. I want you to see it in this image. God was establishing a new way for people to access the blessings of God through the covenant with Israel. So, so as Israel would live in this new way of life, they, they would move into, again, the blessings of God. They would experience peace and joy and harmony. They would experience intimacy with God. They would experience purpose and work and rest as proper places. So the idea is that they would cross over through this covenant back into the blessings of God. But it wasn't just for Israel. All nations would have the opportunity to adopt Israel's way of life. By entering into this nation, they, they could surrender to Israel. They could become a part of their nation. There's a lot that is said in the Old Testament about the foreigners residing among you. What that means is the people from other people groups or other nations that chose to accept Israel's way of life, live according to Israel's God within this system of sacrifices within Israel. And by becoming part of this covenant, even people outside of Israel could enter into the blessings of God. Are you with me? So this was a pathway, a way back to the life God created us for. And, and so Jesus comes along. And throughout this covenant with Israel, all of the Old Testament has been promising that someday God is going to send a future and forever king who will establish a new way of life. And people believed that when, when the Messiah came, he would like solidify Israel as the way to God. But Jesus started talking about something else. He used different language to describe something that, that was true from the very beginning. Jesus comes along and he starts talking about the kingdom of God. Listen to this. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So he starts talking about kingdom of God. New idea but an old concept. With this image, you'll see that the kingdom of God was just Jesus' way of speaking about life within the blessing of God. It's the same idea. The kingdom of God is the return or the restoration of life that we were created for. It's a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of harmony, a kingdom of healing, a kingdom of love and, and, and just hope and joy, harmony among those who are within it. And so Jesus, again, he's introducing an old idea. He's saying, I've come to bring you back into the life you were created for. The question, though, is how do we get into it? Jesus spoke in many different ways, but maybe the clearest is this. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What he's saying is, I'm the way into the kingdom. It's not the old covenant that you've been living by. It's a new covenant through his body, through his blood, through his ministry, through his death and resurrection. And so this image shows us that the new way into the kingdom of God or the blessings of God is not the covenant of Israel, but the person of Jesus. By believing in him as our king, by believing that his death became the sacrifice for our sins, that his resurrection was the victory over evil and darkness and death, and by believing that Jesus now reigns sovereign over all creation. It is through the person of Jesus, faith in him, that anyone, anywhere can cross over from spiritual darkness into the kingdom of God. He was not the destruction of the old covenant. He was the fulfillment of it. He said, I, I came not to abolish the law, but to complete it. And so he 
replaces the covenant with Israel as the way that anyone anywhere can enter into this life we were created for. Are you with me so far? And, and so as we get into the book of Acts, Jesus commissions his disciples. He says, I want you to go and make disciples. He says, I want you to be my witnesses, announcing the good news that I am king and my kingdom is here. And people start to believe. But for the first 10 to 15 years of the spread of the gospel, it was only preached to and received by people who were already Jewish. Okay? Only Jewish community. So it started in the city of Jerusalem, very, very Jewish city. As it went out from there, it was always taken first to the local Jewish synagogue where, where people who were Jews would believe it and receive it. And so there was this commingling of Jewish heritage and Christian belief. And it created this confusion, this conviction that Jesus was not the only layer through which people had to pass to get into the blessings of God. But you'll see in this image that they also had to enter through the covenant of Israel and faith in Jesus. So they were, had added a second layer of expectation, of requirement. So what was happening, is they're saying if you want to come into the kingdom of God, you need to believe in Jesus, but you also have to become Jewish. That means that you still have to be circumcised. You still have to abide by all Old Testament law. You still have to practice everything that happens at the temple. You have to live by all of their holy days every year. You have to go to the priest. You have to be clean ceremonially with what you eat and how you live. You see what I'm saying? So they created a second layer. So you got the kingdom and they believe in Jesus, but they also were requiring people to become Jewish. And this wasn't that bad as long as people were already Jewish coming to Jesus. But as soon as the good news started to go to other people, other parts of the world, they would receive the good news. They'd say, hey, I'm in. And the message was, well, if you want to be saved, if you want to be in the kingdom, you need to make an appointment with your doctor because <laughs> you've got to be circumcised. You need to learn and memorize and apply all of the Old Testament law. You've got to live within the covenant of Israel to get to Jesus in order to come into the kingdom. And this created confusion and frustration for those who were believing in Jesus. It felt like there were hidden fees. There were strings attached. There was fine print they didn't know about. And it made them question whether or not they really wanted to come to Jesus after all, if that's what was included. And that is the situation that is addressed in Acts chapter 15. So that's where we're going to go is Acts chapter 15. We're going to walk through this to see how the early church dealt with this conflict of interest. If you remember, uh, in chapter 10, the apostle Peter had seen this vision from God that alerted him to the fact that this good news of Jesus was for all people everywhere. So he went and he preached to a man named Cornelius, a Roman person. And Cornelius and his whole household believed the message of Jesus. They were baptized. The Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke uh, in, in tongues, just like the people did at the very first day. And so this was a sign that God was doing something new, but people were still wrestling about this. Is this really the work of God? Paul and Barnabas had traveled, these two apostles had traveled the ancient world, preaching and proclaiming the good news to both Jews and Gentiles. That word just means non-Jews. And it had been received by different people throughout the ancient world. And as they brought that report back to the church in Antioch, the church celebrated it, but then something happened. Listen to this. This is, um, Stephen, we're going to skip to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. I'm going to read this for you. It says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, listen to this, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Do you hear that? They're adding a layer around Jesus. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So they come. And while this multi-ethnic church in Antioch is celebrating the work of God among all kinds of people, these leaders from Jerusalem travel to Antioch and they're like, hey, listen up. I hate to throw water on the fire, but if these people aren't circumcised, they're not in. 
These people don't become Jewish. They don't get a place with Jesus. Paul and Barnabas, who've been doing this hard work, they go, hold up a second. And they travel to Jerusalem to meet with the leaders there. Okay, verse 5 says, Then some of the believers who belonged to, this is in Jerusalem, belonged to the party of the Pharisees. They stood up and said, Definitively, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. That's the Old Testament Jewish law. In other words, they must pass through God's covenant with Israel to get to Jesus and his kingdom. So what follows is the author, Luke, his account of three apostles making three statements to confront this ideology. Starts with Peter. Verse 7. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us or them, but he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? He's talking about the Old Testament law. He goes, we've never been able to do that well. We've never been able to follow the law perfectly. It's been a burden for us. We've failed at it. So why are you putting it on them? He goes, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. His argument is, hey, don't you remember the story about Cornelius? Don't you remember how he's not circumcised? He wasn't following Old Testament law, but when he believed in Jesus, he was immediately filled by the Holy Spirit and he was baptized. God said, he's with me. And so how can you argue with God? Next, Paul and Barnabas speak up. Verse 12. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and the wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Paul and Barnabas speak up now and they're like, hey, not only Cornelius, but every city we've traveled to, God has confirmed his choice among the Gentiles by doing incredible miracles among them. Those are from God. If he didn't want these people in his kingdom, or if they weren't ready to enter yet, he wouldn't be doing all this stuff. But God has already proven through miracles that they have a place with Jesus in his kingdom. The last word belongs to a man named James. We haven't met James in the story of Acts yet. James was known as James the Just because of his strict adherence to the Old Testament law. He was also the leader of the Jerusalem church and the half-brother of Jesus. He and Jesus had the same mom, Mary. And James speaks up now. Verse 13, when they had finished speaking, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, who's Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. He quotes Amos chapter 9. He says, as it is written, after this, Or in the last days, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. He's talking about David's kingdom. Remember, Jesus brought a new kingdom. It says, its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may see the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name. He's saying that when God sends a new king, when this new king establishes a new kingdom, it's going to be for all people everywhere who bear God's name. And James' argument is not only has God sent his Holy Spirit to Gentiles, not only has God done miracles among the Gentiles, but also all of this is fulfilling what God always said he would do. So how are we surprised by this and who are we to argue with it? And so the concluding statement was found in verse 19. James says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I love this. He goes, why would we put more layers? Why would we put more barriers between the Gentiles and the kingdom of God? Let them pass only through Jesus and find life in him. And so this was the conclusion. And so the the leaders, the elders in the church in Jerusalem, they decide to write a letter and they send it with Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch. And the letter basically recaps the whole thing. And it says, hey, listen, we're not going to put any other burden on you except to believe in Jesus and live for him. There's this unique caveat. I want to read this for you. 
Because if you read this on your own, which we hope you do, we're encouraging you to read through the whole book of Acts while we're studying. You need to read it on your own. And if you read this story and you get to verse 27, you're going to say, hold on, what happened there? I want to explain it to you. Verse 27 says this. Sorry, verse 28. This is part of their letter. It it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. And so you read that and you'd be like, hold up a second. I feel like we just backtracked. Like they they just agreed not to burden them with like Jewish, Jewish covenant but now they're saying don't, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols or anything that has blood in it, sexual immorality. What's, what's happening here? And all of these things were practices that would have prohibited Jews and Gentiles from finding unity within the church. Jews who had a strong conviction about these things would never have been able to sit around a table with Gentiles who were eating food that had been previously devoted to a false god. They would have said, I can't do that. And so this letter is instructing them not on matters of salvation, but on matters of unity. So it's saying you're already in the kingdom. So now be considerate of others who are in the kingdom with you. Don't do anything to draw a line that will be divisive, but rather honor God by laying these things down, not doing these things so that you and your Jewish brothers can still be one together in the beautiful multi-ethnic community of Jesus. And so from all of this, there is a simple principle for them and for us today. It is this, faith in Jesus, let me say this clearly, is the only requirement for life in his kingdom. Faith in Jesus is the only requirement for life in his kingdom. We ought never to add more to that. Anytime we do, we are walking on dangerous ground. And I I want to explain to you what I mean by faith because there's the chance that you might hear me say this and hear something I'm not saying. So faith is not just intellectually agreeing with statements about Jesus. It's not as if you're like, yeah, I I think he's king, I think he's God, I think I'm good. And then you just go about your life with nothing changed. I want to say two things about faith. Faith first is believing in Jesus as king. It is believing that he is God in the flesh who came and lived a perfect life to die an innocent death so that the payment for my sin and yours would be paid in full and he rose a victorious uh, resurrection so that he could show that he has power over sin and death and darkness and evil and he still reigns supreme today. So it's believing that Jesus is king and it's also, number two, living with Jesus as king. So faith shows up in what you believe and how you live. How you live shows what you believe. So faith is both prongs, believing that Jesus is king and living with Jesus as king. So that means that whatever he says you do, there's no part of your life that you do not surrender to his lordship. There's no part of your life you hold back and go, no, I'm king of this. No, I'm queen of this. He is sovereign over all. That's what faith means. That when you lay yourself before him, when you pass through the waters of baptism, you're saying, Jesus, King, forever over all. My past, all my failures and successes, my present, every decision I need to make about money and time and sex and work and play and rest and family and marriage and everything, I make all those decisions based on what you want for me. In your future, you say, I direct my life toward the things that honor Jesus and bring his kingdom to earth. That's what it means to enter his kingdom by faith. And faith alone is to believe in him as king and to live for him as king. And the truth is, anyone who does that has a place with him. But we are prone, like the people of the first century, to add layers to the gospel. And so the last image I want to leave you with is this. Have you ever added a layer around faith in Jesus as a requirement for what it means to follow him? Have you in any way diluted the gospel 
by placing unnecessary burdens upon those who want to come to Jesus. Let me give you a few examples. Maybe some of you grew up in a religious tradition that said that unless you walk the path of very specific sacraments, you have no place in the kingdom. Maybe you come out of a different movement of faith that says unless you manifest spiritual gifts, unless you are able to speak in tongues, then you must not be saved. Unless you've had this dramatic conversion experience and have an impressive story to tell, then your faith must not be real. See, we start to layer it. I was talking with a friend on Friday night. He was telling me about his experience in in a different expression of, of Christianity. And he was talking about how he grew up in this church with his parents and his grandparents. And and after he made his confirmation, he was gone for a while and he came back kind of a different person. And he said as soon as he walked through, because of the clothes he was wearing and the tattoos he sported on his arms, he could just tell that he did not belong. And he loved God and he wanted to be close to him, but he just knew this was not the place for him. And what had been placed around faith in Jesus was an unwritten rule about how you look in your appearance, how you hold your life together. And if you didn't fit that norm, you had no place with Jesus or his church. I need you to hear this. We cannot add anything to the gospel. It is always and only about Jesus. And so if you ever find yourself saying, you, you must not be a Christian if, and you just complete that sentence with anything, then you are on dangerous ground of adding a layer to the gospel. I need to be honest here. Over this last year, I have heard people on both sides attach political beliefs to what it means to be a Christian. You can't be on that side if you vote like this. You can't be on a side if you follow that. And what we are doing, do you realize what we're doing? We're putting a layer around the good news of Jesus. And I cannot tell you how confusing this is to a world that is looking to the people of Jesus to tell them what it means to follow Jesus. That's why there's so much confusion about what it means to really be a Christian. That's why so much of the world has decided that that if that's what it means to follow Jesus, I'm out. And it actually has nothing to do with him. It has to do with the layers we've created around him. And so we need this message more than we even realize to understand the the decision made and the truth that the Holy Spirit revealed to us that there is no layer of this outside of Jesus. It is him and him alone. We don't have to agree on the minor nuances of secondary theology. We don't all have to look the same or act the same. In fact, it's better if we don't. We just have to agree that Jesus is our king and we will live for him. And that sorts out everything else. And so my question for you is for you or for the people around you, have you added anything? Do you live with this terrible burden of expectation because you've got this narrow idea of what it looks like to be a Christian? Do you find yourself judging others, maybe within the family of God? Do you, do you find yourself assuming that people you work with or live near must not be Christians because of something else? May the Spirit of God convict us. May the Spirit of God purify our understanding of the gospel to believe that it is always and only about faith in Jesus that shows up in what we believe and how we live. May that be the path. And so we see from the very beginning of Scripture that God creates us to live in the blessings of God. Sin pulls us out of that and it causes us and the people we know to search for that all of our lives. God created a way to prepare people for that through the covenant with Israel, but that was always intended to be handed over to Jesus and Jesus is the way into his kingdom. Only Jesus. He says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. So if you have never crossed that path to enter the kingdom, I want to offer you this invitation. Please make today the day that you say, I believe in Jesus and I'm ready to live for him as king. And if that is true of you, then please take a moment after the service to stop by Next Steps, have a conversation with us. We want to talk with you about this and lead you into the next steps. If you are already in the kingdom, then may may this be a reminder of what it is truly about. May we create no additional layers. May we not 
offer obstacles to those who want to come to Jesus. May we lead them always and only to him. I want to leave you with only one reflection question today. And I hope you think about this. Who do you know who might respond differently to the good news if it was only about Jesus? We are surrounded by a world that needs hope, that needs to know the pathway into his kingdom. Who do you know that might respond differently to the good news if they knew that it was only about who he is and what he has done and what he's inviting us into with none of the other trappings that we add to it? Do you know anyone who might just respond differently if it was only about that? If so, start praying that God will give you an opportunity. Starting next week and in the weeks to follow in this series, we're going to start getting much more practical with how we live on mission to take the good news that Jesus is king to the world around us. But before we make that turn, it is so important that we understand that the only thing required is faith in Jesus for those who believe in him and live for him. Holy God, I pray that your grace would pour over us. I confess to you, Father, that there have been times when I have added to the good news, that I have created expectations or even requirements for people. And I just beg you, God, to forgive and to purify my heart and to help us to be a church that makes clear the path to Jesus. Not that it's an easy one. It is a road that will cost us everything in exchange. But may we not add barriers and obstacles. May we simply proclaim the good news that Jesus has come and he is king and his kingdom is here and now ready to be enjoyed and shared with others. Use us, Father, to make that known. In the good name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.